Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Three years ago, Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg was the most popular politician in Germany. Gutenberg was seen as the man who would eventually replace Angela Merkel at Germany's helm. He and his wife were seen as the royal family of Germany. And then his political career was rocked by a plagiarism scandal in March of 2011. He was bashed by the German media. The pundits said his career as a politician was over. But after laying low for a while right here in America, Gutenberg is now back. He's writing op-eds for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. He's being interviewed on CNN. He even had a not-so-secret meeting with Germany's Angela Merkel recently, causing some to suggest that he is about to return to politics. The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. So when you were in the defense ministry, um, you must have seen all this stuff and you must have seen the espionage, counter espionage. Did you assume that the United States was spying on uh, in Germany? Well, everyone spies on each other. That's a fact. And, and at the moment we hear interesting voices that everybody tries to deny that we don't do it and they do it. Everybody does it. What I didn't know and I didn't have an idea of the level of whom to spy. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't have made the decision to spy on the top level of, of alliance partners, of allies. So that was, that's definitely a new dimension and that's probably one of the main reasons for the outrage in Germany. At the so w what do you think that this, this means for European-American uh, relations? How serious is the, has the breach of trust been? It's rather serious. It's something new. We've had misunderstandings on the one or the other side. We have different perceptions on certain issues, name Iraq, Guantanamo, or even climate change and other things. So, but we always had a pragmatic way to reach out to each other and to find a solution. Now we are at the level that European leaders don't only lose faith in a partner, but also their face. So the face losing aspect of it is actually that you take the example of Angela Merkel. She was defending the NSA program this summer, this summer. She was publicly defending it despite being in an election campaign. It was not very popular as you can imagine, but she is, as a committed transatlanticist, she defended the NSA program. And then to learn two or three months later that she personally was tapped and then to learn that actually the American president knew about it already in summer, that's one of the moments which I would consider as being face losing relevant. Following the plagiarism scandal in 2011, uh, Gutenberg relocated here to the United States in Connecticut and uh, started working at a, a Center for Strategic and International Studies, a think tank, where he was given the title of Distinguished Statesman. And as I said at the top of the show, he, he spent quite a lot of time those first few months uh, just laying low, staying out of the, the political scene, out of the news cycle and so on. But as I also brought out, uh, these past six or seven months, uh, he's really been everywhere, writing articles for major newspapers. He's been on well, news programs. On he's been here. He's been in Germany. And then more recently, he even uh, spent time with uh, Chancellor Merkel. In, uh, in Germany. That clip that you saw leading into uh, the program body here was from the interview that uh, Gutenberg recently had with CNN where he was talking about the, uh, the NSA scandals, which uh, we here in America have heard a lot about in recent months. Uh, but more recently, in the last few weeks, of course, uh, it, it came into the news that the NSA was also tapping into Angela Merkel's uh, phone, her cell phone, and that's what he was talking about there in in that interview. Gutenberg wrote a piece recently for uh, Project Syndicate. This was on October 28th and it has uh, some of the same contents in that article that he brought out in that CNN clip that you saw. Uh, and he talked about, in the article, he talked about how this scandal with uh, the wiretapping into Merkel's phone 
how that it had damaged the relationship uh, between the United States and Germany. This is what he wrote. He said, Obama's personality uh, makes matters more complicated. It's hard to recall any other U.S. president who has been so personally disconnected from other heads of state. He's just kind of dumbfounded at the response from the administration after this was made known to the public that there really was a non-response. He, the president sent out his spokesman to address the situation and to give sort of a half-hearted apology. Uh, but outside of that, at least publicly, nothing much was said. Uh, he goes on and writes, instead of immediately reaching out to a friendly country, uh, the president decided to lie low and send White House Press Secretary Jay Carney to issue a rather awkward statement that the U.S. government is not and will not monitor Merkel's communications. Of course, it does not take much interpretive skill to recognize a clumsy attempt to avoid confessing that U.S. intelligence services targeted Merkel in the past. He knows it, and of course he said there in that interview that everyone does it. It's no surprise, really, in one sense. But given the fact that these are supposed to be two close friends, uh, it has caused a lot of controversy in, in Germany. A lot of people are upset by what happened uh, back in October. He writes, in the American political context, issuing an apology, especially to foreign governments, is often viewed as a sign of weakness. In the case of the NSA scandal, an unequivocal apology by Obama is the only viable solution to leave the past behind and move forward. That's what he's expecting. I guess that's what Germany's expecting, an unequivocal apology. Unfortunately, it says, the window of opportunity for such a gesture to be viewed in Europe as a much-awaited olive branch and a sign of real American strength and conviction is closing fast. So Germany wants to receive an apology. Now, he wrote that, that uh, opinion piece uh, after Chancellor Merkel called Obama and, and demanded an explanation, and who knows what they discussed in private. Uh, in any event, uh, what we uh, learned from it publicly was that the administration tried to, as it has been often the case, to uh, say that he didn't know about it or uh, wasn't familiar with all of the inner workings there at the NSA. I'd like to just uh, briefly reference Richard Palmer's article on the real consequences of uh, America's spy games. This was at the, uh, uh, the Trumpet.com on October 25th, just a, a few weeks ago. And uh, in this article, he, he talked about how that because of the scandal tapping Merkel's phone, how that Germany and France are now pushing to be included in America's Five Eyes Club. This is the, the exclusive club where they've agreed to no spying clauses in uh, their relationships with one another. America with their relations with Britain and Canada and Australia, New Zealand, uh, some of our closest allies. And now Germany and France want to be included in, in, in that club. And this is what Mr. Palmer writes about in the Trumpet.com piece. And he says in there that if this were to happen, I mean, this would revolutionize uh, America's intelligence apparatus. And uh, it would certainly compromise America's national security as well if because of this or in response to this, America then went to the other extreme and pulled way back. It could happen, and he talks about it at thetrumpet.com. Make sure that you look for that uh, on the website. It's a few weeks old by now, but still, it would be worthwhile going back and, and reading that. I just want to summarize uh, also a few points that uh, Mr. Gutenberg wrote uh, recently in the New York Times. This is going back to August the 30th, so it's a little farther back than all this NSA uh, dust up. It's an article he wrote titled, Syria and Germany's Culture of reluctance. This was at a time when Syria had, had uh, supposedly launched uh, chemical weapons on its own people. And of course, you remember the, the reaction here in the United States. It was strong at first. Uh, and then Russia intervened to uh, really get the upper hand there internationally. Uh, and along, those, uh, along that same time, uh, Gutenberg was writing about how Germany needed to take a more active stance, a more proactive stance abroad. And, and get rid of this culture of reluctance, reluctance to act, reluctance to use uh, the military. And really, to this date, that, that's the strongest language, really, that we've seen uh, uh, coming from a German official. He's not really uh, uh, in government yet, but he's on his way back, undoubtedly. And he said that Germany needs to let go of that culture of reluctance and, and not be satisfied with just being an economic power but that it needs to be more aggressive 
and look to wield its, its sword abroad and to carry its influence abroad and not just be satisfied with its, its growing economic power uh, at home. This is also from an article um, that was posted just today, in fact, about Germany uh, working with uh, other nations in Europe to strengthen Europe's military might. And it follows right on what Gutenberg was really hoping for back in that August editorial. It says here in uh, the Trumpet.com article, Germany wants to create a new European army, according to one of the latest documents, to come out of its coalition agreement. The coalition paper on foreign affairs and defense published uh, November 19th and approved by the coalition panel, led by German Chancellor Angela Merkel, calls for Germany to face up to its international responsibilities and stand ready if contributions to the resolution of crises and conflicts are expected. Now it goes on and says, the paper explains uh, that in order to be prepared for the mission of the future, the EU must work together wherever useful and possible. There should be a sharing of national military capabilities in the EU, as well as a greater division of labor. That's according to this report that uh, is cited in the, the newspaper article. It says, but its most striking statement was, this is from the report, Mr. Palmer writes, we strive for an ever closer association of European forces which can evolve into a parliament-controlled European army. Now, as you know, well, if, if you followed us for any time, as you know, we've been warning about this for years, that this ultimately was Germany's goal. Even if there is this culture of reluctance, we've told you all about, and I'll spend some time on that in the uh, second segment here in a second, but this has been Germany's goal, and now you see German, Germany's leaders, uh, just as Gutenberg was urging them to do back in August, uh, talking about it publicly. Now, if you go back before that August article that appeared in the New York Times, in April of this year, April the 2nd, we also had quite a lot to say at the time about this other opinion piece that Sue Gutenberg wrote, and it printed in the, uh, the Wall Street Journal. It's titled, Germany Must Have Israel's Back. Now, the context for this particular piece was that here we were early in 2013. Gutenberg knew that this would be sort of the critical year, the make-or-break moment with respect to Iran's uh, nuclear program. And of course, here recently, we've seen that in the news quite a lot with all the talks going on in Geneva uh, and so on. But back in April, when he was uh, writing about the strong ties that Germany had with Israel, he referenced Angela Merkel saying that she's said in the past that Israel's security is, is not negotiable. That has to be uh, maintained. That has to be strengthened, Israel's uh, position of security. Um, and then uh, he said later on that, that uh, Germany or the leaders in Germany need to prepare the German people for uh, the likely strike coming upon uh, Iran from Israel. He, he felt like the German people needed to be made ready for this to happen. And uh, of course, as, as you read or try to think about reading that opinion piece from the Israeli perspective, you see how isolated Israel is today and their furious reaction recently with that deal that almost went through in, in Geneva and that may still go through. Uh, and you can see after reading a, an opinion piece like that from Gutenberg back in April, why Israel would eventually turn to Germany for help and for support. I mean, look at what Angela Merkel, look at what Zu Gutenberg are saying. Look at what they're saying about Germany needing to draw closer to Israel and to really strengthen Israel's position as far as security goes, and that the Iranian problem needs to be dealt with. Germany believes that just as Israel does. Now, they haven't come out quite as strong in those talks uh, in Geneva, but still, you can see the seeds being planted for this prophesied relationship, this prophesied turn to Germany, as Hosea talks about, uh, in the end time for that little nation of Judah in the Middle East, the, the little Israeli state turning to Germany for help and for protection. Now, finally, this is not going back before April. This is more recently that, that secret, supposedly secret meeting between Gutenberg and and Angela Merkel, this was on November the 4th, and we wrote about it a few days later. Brad McDonald talked about it at thetrumpet.com. 
in, uh, in, uh, at the end of that week, I guess, November the 8th, he said, first it shows, he's talking about the significance of this meeting. Uh, it was supposed to be secret, that's the way it was uh, portrayed, but uh, Gutenberg was in Germany, he showed up uh, at, uh, at uh, Merkel's place in a limousine, came out smiling and so on, so it wasn't a very well-kept secret. It says, first it shows that Gutenberg is no longer in the doghouse. Although he was once Germany's most popular politician, Gutenberg, for the past two and a half years, thanks to a plagiarism scandal that forced him from office and banished him from the country, has been a political leper. German politicians have been avoiding him, at least publicly, lest their reputation be tarnished. He says, in a way, Monday's meeting marks the return of Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg into Germany's political fold. I mean, that is significant. He is returning. He's making a comeback. It says he did it in style, too, meeting with the German chancellor herself and at the chancellery. So he showed up in style, and Mr. MacDonald asks in that article, or speculates on what this could mean. Perhaps Merkel's considering giving him some kind of post in her new government. She just uh, won the re-election uh, process there a while back. Uh, maybe he's being recruited. He spoke out strongly about the NSA scandal with uh, tapping her phone. Maybe he's being recruited to repair that relationship between the United States and Germany. But whatever it is, uh, Gutenberg is clearly emerging as a thoughtful and serious voice on the German political scene. He's clearly emerging as a leading voice in Germany. Now, it's interesting if you, again, go back and just look at this, this last three-year period, or two and a half years, I guess it's been, since the plagiarism scandal. During that time where he, he resigned and withdrew from you know, the scene, and uh, was just kind of hibernating for a while. And then more recently, he's a lot more visible. But during that time, if you think about what he uh, missed, Greece's uh, debt crisis, he wasn't there when all of that turmoil was going on. Uh, he left before the unemployment time bomb was put in place in, uh, in Europe. It's a, it's a difficult situation economically over there, and it continues to this day. He, he left uh, just before the serious financial crises hit Italy and, and Spain and France and other nations. He was gone by the time the, the Libyan crisis uh, hit the headlines. So there's a lot of things that he wasn't there for and these are events that many politicians in Europe have taken some major hits for. So he obviously was hurt in 2011 by that scandal of his own making, but it may be that he missed out on taking some major hits from other uh, difficult situations, situations that would have been difficult to, to deal with in, in many ways, as Mr. McDonald suggested in that article back on, on November 8th. I mean, he may have been saved from being wounded in all the crossfire going on there in Europe. I'd just like to plug that article one more time. This is actually one before the, the Merkel article. It goes back to October 31st. Uh, and it's titled The Brilliance of Carl Theodor zu Gutenberg. You can go to thetrumpet.com and uh, download a copy of that today. The indescribable wreckage of the Second World War left hundreds of thousands of civilians in Germany wandering around helplessly, hungry and homeless. Every major city in Germany was buried under a heap of ruin. Adding insult to these devastating injuries, the United States and Britain jointly stated, It is our inflexible purpose to destroy German militarism and Nazism, and to ensure that Germany will never again be able to disturb the peace of the world. Germany had just received one of the worst beatings ever in the history of modern warfare. Its military might had been destroyed, its infrastructure crushed. Against this backdrop, even as Roosevelt and Churchill offered assurances that German militarism had been permanently dismantled, Herbert W. Armstrong warned of a prophesied revival of German might to be fulfilled in the latter days. From the very start of World War II, Mr. Armstrong wrote on May 9, 1945, they have considered the possibility of losing this second round as they did the first and they have carefully, methodically planned in such eventuality 
the third round, World War III. Few could have taken this warning seriously in 1945. Yet today, as Stratford noted in 2010, Germany has become one of the richest, most technologically and industrially advanced states in human history. Just as God said it would be, Germany has risen from the ashes of worldwide war to become the largest, wealthiest, and most powerful state in Europe. It is the beating heart of a revived Holy Roman Empire. For more information about the prophetic rise of Germany and the Holy Roman Empire, request our free reprint article, The Holy Roman Empire is Back. Before the break, I told you about the article we posted just today at thetrumpet.com about Germany wanting to uh, create a stronger European military force. And as you know, uh, if you followed us for very long, this is something that we've been writing about, not just on the website, but in our, our magazine version. This is from a few years back. Germany dominates Europe again. And this is something even going way back before our work that Herbert W. Armstrong was talking about in the 1940s when Germany was in rubble from World War II. But we've written about it over the years. There's probably been more German-themed covers at the Trumpet Magazine than just about any other subject. Germany Save Us is another one from, uh, from May-June 2009. Is Germany's new Charlemagne about to appear? That's from October 2009. So uh, we've covered this story. We've stayed right on top of this story for for quite some time. At the end of the program, I'll uh, refer you to The Holy Roman Empire is Back, a very powerful reprint that we produced back in 2010. Let's go over to Daniel 8, just to conclude with a few scriptures here before uh, the program uh, ends. Daniel chapter 8 talks about uh, a leader that's prophesied to rise up in Europe and to lead that empire uh, in these end times. Daniel 11:21. Uh, just as an aside here, talks about this man, whoever he is, coming on the scene by flatteries, an individual who will undoubtedly not be voted in, but will uh, use flatteries to gain control of the, this resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire. Daniel 8 and verse 24 says, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty, and the holy people. I mean, when this man appears, it's, it's leading us right into uh, a great tribulation period, which is spoken about in so many prophecies uh, of your Bible. And there's, of course, going to be a, a far greater power behind this individual than, uh, than just human might or human power. Verse 25 says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He'll come on the scene talking about peace, as so many leaders in the world do today. And as the Bible tells us, when you hear about peace, peace, sudden destruction is coming. Ezekiel 23. Let's look at the prophet Ezekiel's uh, book, chapter 23. This is the world crisis that Jesus himself prophesied in Matthew 24, right there uh, in Matthew 24 from the Mount of Olives. Go back and read that entire chapter sometime, but everyone's going to be drawn into this con conflict. All the nations of this earth, not just Europe, the United States, the Middle East, the Asian conglomerate, all of them are going to be drawn into this world war. And what happens preceding this worldwide conflict, Ezekiel 23 and verse 9, it says, Wherefore I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians, upon whom she doted. We're picking it up in the middle of the prophecy here. But uh, basically God is saying he's going to deliver the end time uh, Israelites, the descendants of ancient Israel, which as we've been saying for so long, uh, are in Britain and the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so on. God says that these people are going to be delivered into the hands of the Assyrians, which is uh, modern-day Germany. Now, the Bible it talks about this relationship being uh, a, a relationship of love, lovers delivered into the hands of her lovers, as it says there in verse 9. So we can take from that 
and know that there's going to be this end time flowering of U.S.-German relations and we're seeing some of that today. There's a, a momentary hiccup right now with the NSA scandal as I said earlier, uh, but that relationship is going to get closer. It's going to draw closer and, and Germany's going to gain more trust from America as a result perhaps of that recent scandal or others that might be down the road. But this prophesied unity uh, precedes the, a tragic betrayal, as the scriptures also talk about, where the European nations will betray those descendants of Israel. And if you look closely, if you look closely at the relationship, like, like the NSA scandal, you can see the seeds of this, this future betrayal that are going to begin to spring forth here pretty soon. Europe's relationship with the United States as good as it might seem to be in the months or years ahead. It may even improve in some respects, but as the Bible says, it's, it's prophesied to be a very short-term uh, fling, as inconceivable as it might seem uh, to people who aren't students of history or who don't read much of the Bible. As inconceivable as it might seem, the Bible clearly does tell us that America is going to eventually get dumped by its... its European allies or lovers. So this reprint article I was telling you about, uh, the Holy Roman Empire is back. You've got to go to thetrumpet.com and get your copy of this powerful, powerful article uh, today. It's, uh, it's not, not that long. We actually have more booklets and other pieces of literature that you could follow on from this, but this is an excellent starting point to begin with in your study of what lies ahead for the nations of Europe and for the descendants of ancient Israel. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you again next time on The Trumpet Daily.